The French are utterly convinced that in the marriage of food and wine, they are the undisputed masters. <laughs> and France's finest restaurants really do set the benchmark in question. So in some quarters, mention, say, Australian wine and see what reaction you get. C'est les vins qui arrivent du monde entier, qui s'installent en France, qui plaisent. Moi, j'appelle ça des vins, euh, en étant vulgaire, un peu pute, quoi. C'est-à-dire que c'est des vins euh, tellement euh, le goût de bois, ça a le goût de vanille, ça a le goût de, de tout. Et il n'y a pas cette identité profonde qu'on avait dans nos, dans nos vins français. Et là, aujourd'hui, comme il y a ce vent qui arrive, il y a des gens qui risquent français, qui perdent leur âme. Ils vont se dire, ah bah c'est ça la mode, et bien on va faire ça. Alors, dis ce qui passe à la carte, trois salades vertes, une langostine acidulée pour deux, un caviar, un foie gras chaud pour deux et une crudité. Hey to many, Bernard Loiseau is France's best chef. Three Michelin stars. Monsieur Loiseau is something of a legend. Et aujourd'hui, comme moi, je fais une cuisine très goûteuse, très savoureuse, très légère. Elle va merveilleusement avec ses vins de Bourgogne, qui sont très fuités. Quand on met le nez dedans, ça sent bon, ça sent le raisin qu'on vient d'écraser. C'est une pure merveille. Et donc, il y a un mariage extraordinaire entre les vins de Bourgogne et ma cuisine. And he's worried that the marriage between his food and French wine could be on the rocks. Enormously proud of his own culinary innovations, he is at heart a traditionalist. Et le monde entier est passé ici. De Gaulle, Picasso, Dali, Orson Welles, François Mitterrand, enfin tous tous les plus grands artistes, Richard Chamberlain, enfin tout le monde est passé ici. Et donc c'est la tradition française. Et moi je me suis dit, si je reprends cette maison, il faut pas trahir la tradition. Donc pour faire le présent, il faut connaître le passé. Il y a un gâteau d'anniversaire papissier là. Which is why he's horrified at some of the changes going on in the French wine. He's worried that French winemakers are following fashion, abandoning the traditions that have helped set French wine apart. Et ben le vin c'est la même chose. Aujourd'hui il y a un vent mondialiste qui arrive de partout, qui envahit les supermarchés français et tout. Ok bon bah c'est comme ça. Comme McDonald's, ça va se calmer aussi, ça va baisser. C'était comme ça et maintenant ça va être comme ça. Hein. Et donc aujourd'hui, eh ben je dis à tous nos vignerons français, ne vous occupez pas de cette mode. Continuez à faire vos vins comme d'habitude, comme votre grand-père vous a appris, votre grand-mère, votre père, et continuez, persévérez, et vous verrez un jour, tout va se remettre d'aplomb. As well as making truly great wine, for years, the French have also made some truly awful wine. Raising the standard of everyday French wine is partly about technology and know-how, and partly about marketing. David Morrison is an Australian winemaker working in France. Our ethos, if you like, is we're trying to make a wine for $4.99. We try to make a wine that looks like it should be sold for $5.99. Uh, and that's, that's essentially the way we, we go about it. We try to make it look and taste a lot better than the consumer is actually paying for it off the shelf. It's an approach which some argue is at odds with the finest French traditions. <laughs> Well, the first thing we know is that uh, it was planted at the 8th century, which means it should have been probably the first vineyard planted in Pomont. Tsar Pierre the Great, Peter the Great, was the, one of the biggest uh, lovers of, uh, of Claude Lacomarraine in the 17th century. Thomas Jefferson came here at the 18th century beginning of 18th century. And uh, since we have uh, the queens of England, mother and daughter. Still buying this wine. Still buying uh, and uh, mainly drinking it. Pierre Jabalet-Vecher's family are relative newcomers. 
They've been in the wine business since 1834, but in Burgundy for only 80 years. All the country in, in, the, in the history who have or have, uh, have been willing to rule the world have imposed the wine, their wine. The Greeks, the Roman, the French, and they still do. So what does Pierre jabelet vacher think of wines from the New World, from Australia, California, Chile and the like? For me, the New World wines are very important for the wine consumption. They open new wine consumers. They, they look young, they look uh, uh, seductive, they are, they are nice, gentle, not too expensive, and it's very nice for us that the New World wine do the job. So they're a beginner's wine, are they? Yes, they're beginners. And uh, one of uh, 100 new consumers will want to, to look at the bottle of Pomar. One out of 1,000 will wish to drink it, and one out of 10,000 will drink it. The polite dismissal of New World wine conveniently ignores some big shifts in the French wine industry. For more than a decade, New World winemakers have been helping to develop areas of France which might one day challenge the supremacy of Bordeaux and Burgundy. The south of France for me is the New World of France. It's uh, starting to produce wines that are totally changing everybody's image of this particular area as it has been up till now. That old image was one of cheap plonk, but the vineyards of the south of France are being transformed. Uh, we're looking at picking these grapes on Mondays and a couple more days. Um, I think this vineyard, yeah, this vineyard is going to produce uh, a very good wine, something as good as we could uh, expect from Bordeaux, but we'll get half the money for it. Australian wines have always been ex extremely forward, fruity, friendly wines, if you like, wines that people can understand easily. Um, by coming here to the south of France, our methods uh, have allowed the people here to discover some of the fruit and some of the quality of the wines that up to now have been masked by bad techniques, by bad machines, by bad storage, by bad bottling. For years now, local cooperatives in the Languedoc region of southern France have looked to foreign winemakers for expertise and investment. And it's starting to pay off. Quality and prices are going up. Et puis après, donc, il y a aussi un effet de, de reconnaissance euh, des vins du Languedoc Roussillon qui a été fait, et c'est bizarre, mais pas trop par la France, notamment par les grandes régions viticoles comme le Bordeaux ou la Bourgogne. C'est surtout des gens euh, étrangers euh, à la France qui sont ou bien des Américains, des Africains du Sud ou Australiens qui sont venus investir dans la région, qui ont cru à la région, qui font que maintenant on a un essor et qu'on entend partout un peu sur les livres que c'est le nouveau, le nouvel Eldorado des vins. But this is about much more than a few winemakers from Australia and New Zealand rocking the boat. The truth is uh, now uh, mostly women buy wine in supermarkets in France. Most of women don't know what to buy. So how and do mostly, they decide? Out of five women, only one buy the wine because she knows about it. And four of them buy it because it's a nice bottle, I mean, nice label. They like the look of the label and that's exactly. it. Exactly if they don't know about the wine. Fortin de France is a French company run by French winemakers, and it makes the sort of varietal wines labelled after the grape variety, Chardonnay, say, or Cabernet Sauvignon. That's a very un-French thing to do. People are more and more convinced that they have to, uh, as they have to respect the consumer. They have really to be um, precise in what they are doing and in what they have to show to, to, the, to the consumer, to the world. Fortin de France's approach is high-tech, serious business. Traditionally, French wines are identified by place, not the type of grape. 
Yet more than 30% of Fort de France's sales are within France, and it's growing. Because even if some people think that uh, these varietals are not serious wine, it shows that uh, in terms of quality, in terms of price, they are big competitors for all the wines through the world. This is precisely the sort of thing that worries Bernard Oiseau. Alors déjà, on va parler du vin. Pour moi, les dangers, c'est les vins de cépage. Alors je suis contre les vins de cépage. Parce qu'aujourd'hui, vous prenez une bouteille avec l'étiquette et il y a marqué Cabernet. Après, il y a marqué Chardonnay, c'est les vins de cépage. Et vous goûtez ça à l'aveugle, je ne sais pas d'où ça vient. Il y a du Chardonnay, je dis, oh, c'est bien ça, on dirait du, on dirait du, du Meursault. Et puis on me dit, mais non, c'est du Chardonnay du Chili. Ah ben, je dis, bravo, j'ai rien compris. Vous voyez ce que je veux dire Donc attention de ne pas perdre notre identité. Burgundy is a good place to start if you want to understand a little about the extraordinary diversity of French wine. It's a patchwork of tiny holdings, each producing distinctly different results. Dominic Lafont is among Burgundy's best winemakers, and he owns a small piece of Le Mont Rocher, the most prized of all white wines. It's the most expensive land in Burgundy. Worth what? Worth uh, roughly, we're never sure because there's not that many for sale or to buy, close to 50 million francs an hectare. A bottle from here might start at around the $500 mark. To get an understanding of what's going on here, I have half an hectare of Mercer Genevrier, which is produced separately. I have three quarter an hectare of Meursault Perrier, so that's another wine I make. I have 1.7 hectare of Meursault Charm, which is fairly big for, for the area. They're all three di very different wines, and uh, my clients who know these wines know the differences and are expecting something from these three vineyards. In Burgundy, the vineyards have the look of manicured gardens. Every stage of the winemaking process is done with the utmost care. And when the sugar is burnt to alcohol, this goes like this, down, down, down. And uh, see, like this one is 9.97 this morning. It's going to be dry at 9.92. And Dominic so, Lafon's uh, aim is to interfere as little as possible. And I'm always amazed when I have uh, uh, winemakers um, like, uh, who come for harvest to help me from uh, New Zealand, Australia, or California. They all always want to do something. So, the argument goes, New World winemakers try to make the grapes fit their idea of how a wine should taste, which means reliable but rarely exciting wines. If French winemakers start going the same way, then the whole character of French wine could change. And if you're as passionate about food and wine as Bernard Oiseau, then maybe there is cause for concern. Pays par pays, tant mieux qu'il y ait des bons vins au Chili, tant mieux qu'il y ait des bons vins en Afrique du Sud, tant mieux qu'il y ait des bons vins en Californie. Mais nous, en France, gardons notre identité. Sinon, on va se trouver noyé, non noyé, dans les vins mondialistes. On va se trouver noyé là-dedans et on a du mal à retrouver ces petits. C'est comme la vache avec ses veaux, on ne les retrouvera pas. Yet, by common consent, the French are drinking less wine, but better quality wine than they did a generation ago. We work with English supermarkets to make wines that they ask us to make because they, their clients want it. Uh, we're doing exactly the same thing here in France, uh, making contact with the supermarkets and the agents to uh, do the, exactly the same thing uh, for the French market. And you think the French are going to want to drink the sort of wine you want to make? We're showing them something different. There's something they haven't discovered in their own... It's a potential that they haven't discovered in their own country. At Fort de France, it's full steam ahead. Never mind what Bernard Loiseau thinks. I, I'm sure that Ms. Monsieur Loiseau travels a lot through the world, but he, he can only uh, be convinced by the work that people do, and that even if it's varietal wine, it's not prostitute at all. It's wine which expresses through the varietals the quality of the soils and the region from where they come, and also they express the style of the winemaker of the company who does this wine. For many, though, that's a huge change from the way the French have been making wine for centuries. 
You need only scratch the surface of French wine to understand just how much there is to know and treasure. Louis Saint Georges, 1959. Richebourg, 1953. Two bottles left. The French have set the mark for wine, and they're not about to throw it all away. Le Montrachet, 1969. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we are going to taste it, if you please. I'd be delighted if you accept. I accept. And even if you wanted to, is it possible to standardise wine? Beautiful noise. The French wine industry has always taken account of foreign tastes. That's nothing new. Look at this colour. It's golden, isn't it? Intense. Hmm. Smells truffles. Right. Every connoisseur in the world know, knows that Morache is the best white wine in the world. And when you will be able to find this wine 30 years after in the New World wine, you will imagine that the New World wines start to be good wines, great wines. And I hope they will succeed. In the meantime, perhaps, let's simply pay homage to the French for bringing us this far.